During times of uncertainty, it's comforting to know we have a healthcare system in our community that's been committed to supporting us for well over a century. In this current time, we are standing together and our bond is stronger than ever. KDMC, caring for our community like no one else can. All right, um, not great at these Zoom calls, so uh, bear with me. Um, but I appreciate everybody being on today. Um, it's an exciting time of year. It doesn't feel like it yet. We need a little warmer weather. But uh, man, baseball's cranking up and uh, we're getting going. And, um, you know, just like I said, I appreciate you guys being on and, and supporting our program and, and writing about our program. Um, it's been a long year um, since, man, since we finished that last game with Texas Tech and the crazy spring and summer and fall. Um, man, our guys have been through a lot. And um, it's exciting for them to be able to be back on the field and have a chance to play and, and be able to be with their teammates and hopefully be in front of fans and, and play on the road and, and get back to some normalcy in their baseball careers. Um, I, I want to highlight a couple things that, that we've done since we've been off the field. Um, man, we have a special group of kids and we have a special uh, you know, circumstances they've been going through with a lot of online classes, a lot of different world that we're in academically. We finished our seventh straight semester with a 3.0 GPA. Um, man, we had 16 guys, 3.5 or higher, and uh, man, we finished with a 3.14 uh, GPA. And, and I know it's not the most exciting news, but for us, man, getting these guys their degrees before they move into pro ball is huge. And we couldn't do that without an unbelievable academic staff with Amanda Seifert and all our all our help in the academic center. She uh, she's phenomenal, but. Um, in these times, I, I didn't even know our guys knew how to turn on a computer nine months ago. So for them to be able to do well in all these online classes is fired up. And then Jason Wire and Seth Deiter on our, our health side, Mary McClendon. Um, man, all the protocol, the things that we have to do to be able to get us on the field, um, to get us to Dallas, to get us into these ballparks and play, um, takes a lot of extra work. And I just want to take a second to thank all those people who who really work in that world for us because um, they've had to do a lot more in this year than normal. Um, so it, it's been pretty good that way. The last piece is we put out our schedule last week. So our schedule's out. Um, it's probably not 100% done. We're still waiting on some contracts. It might change. It could change multiple times. I'm just talking to other coaches across the country. Um, man, we're going to work to pivot. We've talked to our team a lot about attacking the curveball this year. Uh, for us to understand there's going to be obstacles in our way. There's going to be curveballs thrown at us. Uh, we have to expect it. We have to be able to handle it. So it's probably the same thing's going to happen in the scheduling world, the travel world. Um, we're just hoping we can get back to normalcy as, as soon as possible. Um, Baseball-wise, for our guys, um, when we got back a couple weeks ago, we, um, the last contact we kind of had with our guys in terms of coaching was the week before Thanksgiving. So it was a, the longest break ever for us not to have our team, not to be a part of our team. So a lot of the training, a lot of the discipline had to go into the players. And so hopefully, um, and it looked like they did a great job. They went home, they got after it, throwing programs, weightlifting programs. We've come back at a pretty good health. Um, we have a couple pitchers who are just uh, a week or two behind, no injuries really, but just a week or two behind trying to get their arm strength back up. But for the most part, our, our group started back this weekend throwing in scrimmages. We played uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, had three really good scrimmages, um, pitched well, um, hit hit well, and really uh, you know had some great you know playing offense is what we're talking about a lot right now, moving runners, getting bunts down, getting runners in. I thought we did a really good job. And we defended at a really high level this weekend, which is the most exciting piece for me. Um, we bragged a lot this year about our pitching staff. Um, but to have a great pitching staff, you have to defend well behind them. And we played uh, our last two scrimmages, we played airless baseball, which for early in the year is a little strange. So, But I was excited to see that from our guys. Um, we got a couple more weeks coming up. Um, facing some tough weather this week, so we're bouncing around some scrimmages, doing some different things. We'll scrimmage this Thursday, we'll scrimmage Saturday, we'll scrimmage Sunday, maybe indoor or outdoors. Um, but once again, we just have to adjust and move forward and try to get our guys as much work as we can. We're trying to get the volume of pitches up for our starters. We're trying to get the volume of at-bats up for our starters. So those are two really big pieces for us right now, trying to get guys um, you know, ready, game ready, 
and ready to play. We have a lot of experience. Uh, we have a lot of youth. So uh, being able to blend those two together, being able to have great team chemistry during all this because we have a bigger roster than we normally have. We have more expectations maybe. And people ask me all the time, you know, Coach, y'all look like y'all are pretty good. And, and, and I can't lie, I think we have a really good team. I said, unfortunately, I think everybody, because of COVID, thinks they have a really good team. You have more players than you used to. So the challenges will still be the same. Um, and we'll just have a couple more obstacles out there in front of us. But um, I'll go ahead and open it up for questions. And if anybody has questions, um, I can take those. If you have a question, please do your name in the chat. We'll start with Dan. Chris, just obviously it's been a little while since we saw Brandon Smith on the mound. Just how's he looking and, and what do you kind of see his role as? I know we heard he might be in the bullpen last year. He started some games his first year. I guess just where do you see him fitting in? Um, man, he's better every time we see him. This weekend he throws a ton of strikes. Um, he was 89-91, pitched two innings. I think he'll throw another two innings this week. Um, I think early on you'll see him in the bullpen because we got to get him back out, got to get him acclimated. Um, but I think over time you could see him fall into a starter role. I mean, he has that type of stuff. His body is stronger than ever going through rehab. This kid, I mean, this kid works, and um, his body's in great shape, but his arm's working good. We spoke about it last week, and I think he's pretty fired up and positive about it, but that's just another veteran arm we get to run out there. And just quickly, in terms of that, are there any guys that may miss opening weekend right now that aren't on track to get be ready or any – kind of major injuries to report? We, we have no major injuries right now, knock on wood. I just have a couple guys that may be a week or two behind. So I think they'll be ready to go, but um, we'll have to figure that out over the next two weeks. I hope this weather doesn't slow us down because sometimes if a guy's coming back, um, you hate to run him out there in cold weather. So, um, But right now, we knock on wood, we don't have any major injuries. We got everybody kind of on board. We just, we have, a, you know, we have a couple guys that are just a week or so behind. Go to Joel. Hey, Chris. There's been a lot of talk, obviously, about the pitching staff and the depth you have there. I'm just curious, from a position player standpoint, uh, you, you know, obviously, you know your team a lot better than we do. I, I think I could probably sketch out what I think maybe a start nine would look like and things, but I'm just curious, like, what, where are the position battles that, that you see from a position player standpoint? Are there any, are you kind of set in your mind right now with? who you think would be that starting nine. And I guess a, a two-parter there, how concerned are you about replacing the production of, of Bosque and Westberg in the middle of that order? Well, I'm always concerned with that when I have to fill out the lineup card. You know, you don't have two guys like that, you know, very often in your career. So um, replacing them will be tough. Like I've told people, you don't replace them one-on-one. -on -one. You replace them uh, with an accumulation of everybody around them. So I think that's the everybody picks up a little bit of their production, even though we have some really good players in those spots that I'm excited about. But, um, you know, our position battles, um, man, left field's a big position battle going on right now. Um, it could be a rotation, some lefts, some rights. Uh, you know, Braylon Skinner's, you know, come back and, and, and kind of did what he did at the end of the fall, pretty electric baseball player. Um, still got to go out there and prove it. Um, Brandon Pimentel, so if we want to play a left-hander, uh, Brad Cumbest, you know, has come back, and Brad's, you know, got five at-bats under his belt now. So just coming out from football is always a harder transition um, with some of those guys and trying to get people involved in the outfield. Third base for us is a big transition right now, too. So we don't know, um, you know, guys at third. You know, you got a handful of guys at third, and, um, you know, that – that battle may play out where it's just, uh, you know, one guy plays against lefts and rights and see who can win the job, um, who's going to play there late in the game. You know, so we're trying to figure out a lot of those pieces. Like you said, there's some – Josh Hatcher's going to play first base, you know. Um, Tanner Allen's going to play right. We got, you know, certain guys that we know and, and being an older, more mature lineup. Um, but we do still have some battles. And then DH role is big for us too right now. I think the DH role is huge um, because as we, we try to line up lefts versus rights, especially going into the first couple weekends, trying to figure out, you know, who, who we'd put in the lineup. And lineup for me is the hardest part right now. I'm, I keep thinking of lineup and how we're going to line, you know, hit some guys in our order. So I'm trying to trying to figure that out, using some different lineups every day as we play. We'll go to David. 
uh, Coach, you, know, you talk about the players dealing with this long absence. What's it like in the coaching office getting ready to finally get a season going? <laughs> it's exciting. So it's even more exciting for our wives. I think our wives are glad we're, we're at work. So it's um, it's been a long year. And uh, I tell you, just being back and our first day back when you saw all the trucks pull up and all the guys show up, you know, we live through those guys. I mean, that's the nice part. You, 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 the youth, I mean, they keep you young. And for us, we're able to see the guys, hang out with the guys, practice. It's an enjoyable group. They like to work. Um, and, and so that's been a lot of fun from them, just being able to, to get back and get going. And it'll be fun to have another opponent in the other dugout. I mean, that's been the longest point of my career for the last 26 years. Um, been the longest you know, time that we haven't competed against somebody else. So um, it's just going to be a really competitive first weekend. So be careful what you wish for. Now we're going to talk to Coach Gotro in just a little bit about the offense and other things. But you looking at the offense, you mentioned kind of a plain offense in that regard. But you showed some pop this past weekend as well in scrimmages. Do you, do you think this offense really has capability both to hit for power, but also hit for average? I do. I, you know, as, as we build our offense and we build our scheme here, you know, we want to be well-rounded. So we don't, you know, we'd like to be in the middle of the pack of the SEC in home runs. Um, but, man, we'd really like to be a team that gets on base, that moves the baseball, that puts pressure on you, that doesn't strike out. So there's a, there's a blend there for us of trying to put together both. But we did. We had some guys, I think we had four home runs on Saturday uh, with our group, one on – Sunday, maybe another one, you know, so we got some guys with pop. Um, sometimes they don't sell out. I think Tanner Allen would hit a lot more home runs for you if he just tried to pull the ball down the right field line. But um, those 10 doubles he gives you in the backside gap with runners on base, it, it, you know, you lose some of that sometimes. So I, I think we have a nice plan. I think you'll see us. We have some guys that can hit for power. I mean, Logan Tanner's a kid who's who's got as much power, you know, as he's just got to be able to get it off in the real games. And I'm, I think we'll see that as, as the spring goes on. John. Hey, Chris, how's it going, man? Um, first thing, I guess, how emotional do you think opening day is going to be for you and your guys? You know, last year you kind of just had the season slipped away from you. I mean, you know, how how emotional do you think? I, I think it'll be pretty fired up. I mean, we, we took the first game of the day. So we're playing out, we're jumping out there playing one of the first games in college baseball in that environment against that opponent. Um, there's always butterflies. There's always nervousness. I think after the first two or three innings, hopefully we can settle down and and play Mississippi State baseball. But um, I think it'll be I think it'll be pretty exciting. I think it'll be um, our guys are amped. I mean they're ready. Usually in preseason training, you get tired of playing each other about the second or third week. I feel like our guys, you know, even somebody made a comment this weekend, just man, we're ready to play somebody else. We're ready to to strap it on with somebody else. And so I think that piece of that excitement, that that nervous energy, it'll be there that, you know, as we head on that plane and, and head to Dallas for that tournament. Based on uh, the errorless baseball that you just said, that has to probably be pretty, pretty soothing considering how long the break was for your guys to see them come back playing so well. Someone specifically I wanted to ask about was Christian, all the uh, hype surrounding him this season. How do you think he treated the off-season plans and all that stuff. Where do you think he currently stands and, and, and his ceiling as a player? Well, he had a good off-season. He went uh, – he did a lot of training when he went home too. So he had a good fall. Uh, but the challenge was is not to be satisfied where we're at, not to be status quo, to push it forward. And so I think he went home over the break. I mean, his velo has been a little bit more in his pins and everything else, his arm strength. I think he's, you know – He's not satisfied where everybody says he's at. He's trying to move up and, and be better, and that's what the great ones do. And so um, for him, he had a good outing this past weekend. I'm um, looking forward to him just, you know, getting his, you know, the key for us is getting his pitch count up in uh, this preseason time. And he's, you know, he's one of those guys that's just such a high level of pitchability. I mean, the guy really knows how to pitch. It's an upper level breaking ball. It's a really good change up. His analytics really match up. He tunnels the ball really well. And so I think, you know, with him, um, you know, you're going to see a lot of that come through. But he's, you know, I'm proud of him in the fact that he hadn't sat back and said, hey, if I could just be what I was last year, I'll be all right. His mindset's been, you know, I got to be better. I, w I want to be better. I want to keep pushing forward. Um, you'll see that with a lot of our arms. I don't, it's not coach speak. It's just we have a handful of guys. Those guys are pushing each other right now. You know, those guys are trying to be, each one wants to be the ace of the staff. And so we have a, we have a really good contingent there of pitchers and competition b building. Go to Brian. 
Coach, you think about your second-year players, the guys who were freshmen last season. You know, they've got the extra year in the program, but they don't have the at-bats and they don't have the innings that you would normally expect going freshman to sophomore. From just a developmental standpoint, how are guys like Logan Tanner, Cameron James, and Landon Sims looking as compared to what you would see from a normal first- to second-year player? Well, and I don't want to overhype our sophomores. They're, they're really freshmen, but they were freshmen last year. But we feel like we have one of the better sophomore groups in the country. And um, I, I really challenge them because it's a big group. They're talented. And like you said, there's more guys in there across the board of, of that sophomore. People don't know about Casey Hunt or Xavier Lovett or, you know, some of those different guys that we have in that class. We have a really special group. Um, but like I keep telling them, you've never played an SEC game. People rave about our pitching staff. Man, I love our pitching staff. Out of our three starters that we had there at the end of the year last year, we have one inning in SEC play. So um, that's the challenge for us, is to be able to jump out there, build momentum in this non-conference part of our schedule, and then be able to take that into SEC play. But I, I really like, those guys have been really good. Logan Tanner, um, special catcher. Cameron James is playing shortstop for us every day right now. Um, and, and has really made huge jumps offensively. I'm, I'm excited about him. Landon Sims, he's our X-Factor guy. I mean, he can do everything. As talented as probably anybody on our staff, but, um, man, he's just, he, he's just a tough, hard-nosed kid. I, I feel comfortable running him out there in any situation. So those guys have been really good. We just got to see how, uh, how they handle a full season. Robbie? Coach, we haven't talked a whole lot about Scotty DeBrule, and he was a guy that came in, one of the top hitters uh, in college baseball, and, uh, you know, he's taken over at, at second base, I guess, or uh, being inserted in that lineup. What's your thoughts on what he's been able to do in the off season, and how do you kind of see him meshing with what, what you want to do from a hitting standpoint? Yeah, he's been uh, – this past weekend he went 0 for 8, so I'm worried about him. But he actually had three or four hard-hit balls right at people. So, But he won our yellow jersey for our best defender, making great plays everywhere. He's a real hitter, so we uh, give him a hard time when he goes 0 for 8. But he's a guy who can uh, – he's played a lot of college baseball, um, played summer baseball. And so he's uh, – our biggest message to him over that long break, it took him a while to get started last fall. Uh, you know, his first couple weeks were very okay. His last two weeks with us, he was one of our better players on the field in the fall in our World Series. And um, he's come back in a lot better shape, ready to go, um, playing really fast on the field. He's, he can really move for, um, you know, so he's going to steal some bases. He's going to cover some, uh, covers that four hole really well in our scrimmages. And then, you know, I talked about it earlier. He's one of my pieces. I don't know where he's falling in our lineup right now. I mean, he literally could hit leadoff all the way down to six. I mean, he's hit cleanup at times, you know, in college. So, you know, trying to figure out where we're going to play him and where we're going to put him. I know where I'm going to play him. I'm going to play him at second. But where he's going to hit in the lineup is, is something I'm still trying to figure out. And that may change all year long, depending on who we're playing, who's hot, who's not. But he gives us a lot of versatility. You good, adult. Hey, Coach, you kind of touched on this a minute ago with Brian, but, um, you know, in terms of evaluation, what all do you miss out on with an entire SEC uh, schedule getting canceled like it was last year? I, I think the what we missed out on is the growth of the players. You know, a lot of them that going through that grind of the SEC, understanding what that's all about, and it's a grind. It, my first year here, I thought I figured it out. I've been coaching for 20-something years. Man, it was a grind. Coach Gotro always calls it a league of no mercy. You play one team, you wake up on Monday and – Ugh, we got to play the you know the other one. You're just playing in such a hard league and a division that I think that experience piece for our kids and then their chance to just play and then they usually play, go through it. They get a reset in the summer and they get a chance to go out and have a really good summer. If they struggled some during SEC play and they they lose both of those pieces for the most part. Some of our guys played some summer ball, but some didn't. So we're you know fighting those two areas is uh, you know was tough for us. So you know the experience side handling it. They probably won't have to handle crazy crowds, you know, but you have to get used to that playing in this in this league. So um, those are kind of the areas that I think we miss out on. Let's go back to Ben. Chris, you kind of touched on the pitching staff, but just in terms of that, do you have an opening day starter in mind yet, or is that still being figured out? I do not. We're trying to figure out how we match up, and we got to figure out how guys get through their work. So, you know, just knowing, you know, our – these days we're having to move around. We've already had to move around a scrimmage this week, so trying to figure everything as we get closer. Uh, we'll announce that probably Monday or Tuesday of game week. We'll have a pretty good idea. 
I mean, given you all are playing three different teams, I mean, does this look different than, say, like just Friday, Saturday, Sunday guy than than the normal weekend? It does because we're trying to see is there a really big matchup piece in there? Is there a better day to throw the lefty? Is there a better day to to match our guys up? So we're kind of looking at it that way. Um, If a normal weekend we're playing one team, it would probably be a little bit more set a little earlier. But for us, um, you know, we're we're, we're trying to wait and do a little bit of scouting. We're we're in a heavy scouting piece right now trying to watch – and see what these guys have done in the past. And then just one quick follow-up. In terms of Christian, I know you've had a lot of really good pitchers just in your time in Mississippi State and with Jonathan Stevers of the world in Indiana and others, but just how does he compare to guys that you've had in the past, or is there anyone that he's similar like or profiles like, or is or how is he maybe different? Well, you know, I think with Christian, there's just been a maturity the whole time he's been here. He showed up very mature. It's, uh, you know, it's a big-bodied lefty with the, that knows how to pitch. And... Uh, if you meet Christian off the field, it's like the nicest kid ever. And then all of a sudden on game day, he turns into, you know, he's, he's you know, a tough competitor. You don't realize how how tough he is. And so I think that's what you, we've seen as we've run him out there and done. Um, his stuff continues to grow. You know, there's probably some guys who will throw harder or, or some things like that, but his total package is pretty special. And, and um, you know, I think I, comp-wise, I really don't have a real comp for him. You know, but I think he's, you know, he's got a chance to be one of the better left-handers out there in the country. Get back to Joel. Chris, I want to follow up real quick. A minute ago, you were talking about uh, third base being one of those battles. Obviously, I guess Landon Jordan would be in the mix there. Maybe it's Kellen Clark. Who, who am I kind of missing there? Who's kind of in that third base? Those are the guys. It's, um, you know, you got Kellen Clark, you know, big freshman from Brandon. Um who's worked really hard to play over there. You got Landon Jordan, who Landon's, you know, an older player. He's played there some for us in his career. Um, Had a really good summer last summer. I think he was the hitter of the league or whatever last summer in his league down by his home. You got Tanner Leggett, who's been a swing guy for us, who's who's a right-handed hitter. And then we have Lane Forsythe. Lane is a real swing guy for us. Lane is a young freshman. Um, But, man, he can really, really defend. And he plays short a lot right now. But we're bouncing him around, playing some second, playing some third, making sure that he's ready to go. Um, as, as good of a young defender, I've, I've been around in a long time, just got a chance to do some special things from the defensive standpoint. And he's a right-handed hitter too. So depending on who's hot, who's not, who we're facing, you could see us play three third basements in a game sometimes. I don't know. But, um, you know, those guys are all competing right now. They're all playing well. So it's going to make it a tough decision for me. I was going to ask quickly, too, about – we talk about your weekend guys a lot, but midweek, I know uh, maybe Houston Harding or uh, – I know you flirted a little bit back in the fall with Landon Sims maybe uh, getting some starts and things. I don't know if that's something that's still ongoing, but just curious about uh, kind of who's your top two or three midweek guys, you think, right now. Well, I told our coaching staff we, we, we're not going to worry about Tuesday and Wednesday this for opening weekend. Everybody's on hand. Everybody's, you know, ready to go. Um, but I, I think our normal midweek guys, you, you, like you mentioned, Houston Harding is a, is a midweek possibility. We have another very talented left-handed pitcher that people haven't seen named Cam Tuller. Um, Cam has an opportunity to be a midweek starter or a weekend starter at some point, another left-handed pitcher. Um, we got Carlisle Costler, who um, pitched midweek for us and some of the weekends for us last year. And then we have our freshmen. So our freshmen, you know, Jackson Bristow's a guy who's – Made a really big jump as we got him back from the break that could get some midweek starts. We just have to figure out, you know, what's more advantageous for us to have one of those guys on the weekend or do some of those midweek guys have to – do we need that lefty out of the bullpen? Is that more important in SEC play? So, um, you know, we have some nice options. I mean, the one thing we do is have some depth uh, of that pitching staff. But those would be some of the guys that we'd look at probably uh, right now. We'll go to PJ. Hey coach, so losing Foscu and Westberg last year to the MLB draft, there appears to be some need for senior leadership. How do you think guys like Josh, Tanner, Rowdy will fill that role? Well, th- that's that's the blessing for us is having those guys back. I mean, we're getting not only great players, but their maturity, their energy they bring, um, guys who've been through it, and, and I say that over and over, but guys that have been through it is, um, you know, really big – big piece they've been there they've done it they've been to Omaha they've they've played in you know SEC uh, you know big Friday night game so um, they do a great job we also have you know 
I guess Carlisle Costler may be the oldest guy in college baseball, so experience for him. And then Spencer Price is right behind him and Riley Self and some of these older guys. And, and our rotation now of, you know, with Sarantola and McLeod and some of those guys, they've been around a while too. So, like I said earlier, we have a lot of experience. The, the chemistry piece has been great, especially being that, you know, you worry about how close can your team be, how great a culture can you have when everybody's supposed to separate six feet and wear a mask and – not be here and not be there, but our guys have done a great job with it. So um, I think we'll be fine in that aspect. Awesome. And just uh, one follow up: Have you noticed any of those guys doing anything over this long off season to kind of help get those guys going? Anything extra over the top, and you know, helping them out with programs or anything like that? I, I just think you know, um, helping the younger guys out's been the biggest piece. I think with so many new guys in the program, you've seen some guys kind of grab a young guy, you know, and, and help him out or, or do something that way. But I think that's kind of the – they understand their roles inside their position groups mainly is, is where you see that. And I see, you know, certain guys, you'll see a Cameron James and a Lane Forsyth working, and they're, they're working together. Even though they're competing against each other, they're working together. Same thing with those pitchers on the pitching staff. Um, the competition level is so high to pitch here right now. And those guys, you know, as, as high as it is, you, you still see guys working together and helping each other out. Good to John. Chris, it's just kind of a quick follow-up to what Ben and, and Joel asked, but it, it sounds like you've got a couple starters kind of solidified in, in what you're trying to do between, you know, Christian, Eric, Harding, and Week. But when what's like a timeline that you would like to have kind of your starters established for for days and, and what you're trying to do? Well, you know, I'm hoping it's that week before we start, you know, um, and if everybody pitches good, you stay with it. I've been a big fan. I don't like to bounce our guys around a lot once we get started. So, um, you know, we spent a whole fall working and getting after it. We're back right now. They get three starts here in the preseason. Um, and then once we announce, I'd like to, you know, feel like we can be in a pretty good rotation and, and go through it that way, you know, for most of the season. It, it usually never ends up that way. You know, you somebody gets scratched or somebody's – not pitching good, and so you have to develop the other guys behind them. But um, I'd like to think that Monday, you know, before we head out to Dallas, we should have a pretty good idea of rotation. And uh, midweek starters will bounce. They're, they're going to bounce depending on who we're playing, who had to pitch on the weekend. Um, for us, the weekend, especially, you know, our first two weekends, man, you, you play, you jump out there and play um, that tournament in Texas. And then, you know, two lanes coming in here with a really good team, too. And then, um, we got some good midweeks coming, so we got we got a lot of work ahead of us, you know. And winning those weekends are always huge. We'll close it out with Ben. Chris, obviously in a year with the shortened draft and all that you bring back, obviously the juniors, but guys like Kellum and Jackson Fristo maybe normally wouldn't wouldn't make it to school. I guess just what does that do in terms of your lineup and having those guys, you know, now be here for a couple of years and and in terms of building that depth. Well, that depth is huge. I mean, getting some of those special players to school was, was a big part of that, that five-round draft. I mean, in, in other years, you could have seen a Jackson Fristo be taken, uh, Kellum Clark be taken, Mikey Tepper be taken. I mean, Kate Smith, we have some of our pitchers there that we could have lost, you know, going in. So, you know, adding those guys in, you know, the, the tough part about our league is our entire league benefited from that. So there's great players that came in all the way across the league. So it's a little bit of an equalizer. But, you know, I, I think as you look across and see college baseball, because of these new draft changes, is going to get stronger and be a better product. But it's, it's going to be a lot of talent. And I think it shows a lot for how college baseball as a whole is developing talent and getting talent into professional baseball. That I think it's, uh, you know, kids are coming out and they're ready to play. That'll do it. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, guys. We'll see you all soon. Uh, Coach, we were just talking to Coach Lamonis and now talking to you. It's been about 11 months since y'all put a batting order together. What's it feel like to spend these next couple of days thinking, okay, who are we going to hit our first game? It feels great. <laughs> it's been a long time. We've been waiting so long. And, and I know everybody in, you know, ended up um, dealing with the shutdown, but uh, we didn't do well with, with um, not doing much for, for almost a year. But the boys are back, and uh, just being on the field has been great. And now we're getting close and trying to figure out what this team's going to look like. Um, but as we as we work through lineups and we talk about things like that, um, everybody seems to be getting better, you know. And so it's a positive, obviously. And um, we're going to keep trying to make them better and, and see uh, see who's going to be out there opening night. But 
we have a lot of great options. Uh, so I guess the last 11 months, you yourself have gone through your mind, who would I be batting today if I was playing this team? You know, who we got, who's hot? You think about it a lot. There's a lot of downtime, and you're, you're thinking about this team nonstop. Um, but like I said, the good thing is there's, there's a lot of really good options, you know, and um, you're facing the righty, you're facing the lefty, you want to be a little more defensive, you want to you want to play for a little bit more juice. There, there's a lot of options there. It could be speed. Um, so we do. Uh, we kind of go around and around and around. And I think a lot of times it's all depends on the matchup and, and who you're playing and, and who's on the bump and things like that. Good to Robbie. Hey, Jake. Uh, last year was supposed to be a, a big breakthrough season for, for Josh Hatcher in a year that he was really going to improve his draft stock. And then all the things happened that happened. How has he attacked this offseason, and what, what have you seen from him that might look different or, or better than, than last year when he was going into that draft-eligible season? Yeah, Hatch um, kind of has picked up right where he left off. And I could see that, that he was starting to turn the corner last year before everything was shut down. Um, he's super talented. Most of it became was pretty much a part of the maturity process for him as a hitter and having an approach and, and things like that. But... Um, he looks really good. He's a special talent, special kid. He's one of our leaders. Um, there's a lot of stuff he can do on the baseball field. He can really run. He can really defend. He can play in several different spots. But, but now he's more in that veteran leadership role and, and really taking pride in, in taking the young guys under his wing and, and telling them this is how we play the game of baseball here at Mississippi State. So um, I think the world of him, uh, he's got a very high ceiling, and, and I think he's going to do well for us this year. A little follow-up on that. I mean, we saw some of that raw power from him his freshman year right away. He came in and flashed that against Southern Miss and then kind of tailed off a little bit. It looked like he kind of hit a wall. What, where do you feel like his ceiling is? Uh, how much better do you feel like he can get, and what are some things that you feel like he can Im improve on this season as he gets ready to, to move on possibly? So even when, when Hatch first got here, he was he was kind of skinny, um, but, but wiry strong, had a very efficient swing, um, that created leverage and, and bat speed and um, had the potential to really drive balls. So now he's probably in a little bit better position to hit. He's a lot more physical. So now you're seeing um, a more efficient path, a, a more bat speed. Um, he was really good to center the other way when he first got here. He didn't pull the ball as well as he wanted to. So now he's, he's really, really progressed as a, as a hitter when it comes to the pull side of the field and, and tapping into some more of that power that way. So I don't like to put a lot of um, numbers and expectations on the boys. I don't think that's fair uh, in, in this league. It's, it's really challenging. But I can tell you that he's, he's really, really improved into a, a special all-around player. And um, I feel like he's really turned the corner to be one of our guys. He's going to go out there and, and go about the right way. And I think he'll do well for us. Go to Joel. Hey, Coach Gotro. Uh Obviously, Cameron James, uh, a guy we saw some flashes from last year a little bit before things got shut down, and, and now moving him back to, I guess, what I think was his natural position coming in at, at shortstop, if, if I'm not mistaken. But e either way, from an offensive standpoint, just how, how big do you anticipate him being? Uh, I know nobody can replace Foskey Westberg, but it, it kind of seems like he's Cameron's going to play a little more of a centerpiece of this team this year, being at short. and possibly being somewhere near the middle of the order and, and things. Just kind of where do you see him and what's his ceiling offensively? He's been really good for us um, across the board. Um, he is a, a true shortstop, and so he's back in his natural position. Um, he's been playing well there. Um, the bat is really starting to come. Uh, I thought just last year from the first day he got here to where we were during the season, he had improved. But the jump from Texas Tech and Biloxi to today um, it's been a pretty big difference, you know, and so um, I think if he just continues to do what he's been doing in regards to his work and preparing, he's got a chance to, to be a special player as well. You know, um, we talk a lot about going into 2019, the steps or the jumps that Foskey and Westberg made from their freshman to sophomore year, you know, and, and those jumps for them helped us as a team tremendously. So when you're looking at the players and the makeup and the work ethic and things like that, um, you kind of look at it the same way. Cam should be able to make a nice jump, and I don't know what that jump's going to be. It may be better, it may be almost as good, as good, who knows, but, but as long as he keeps getting better, um, he's an exciting player for us for sure and should be in the middle of the, middle of the lineup somewhere. Good to bet. 
Jake, I think I asked you about this at Media Day last year, which feels like 10 years ago. But just in terms of, you know, balancing draft stuff, obviously you were a first-round pick yourself and, and guys have gone through that kind of thing. Just w with the shortened draft and guys like Hatch and Rowdy and Tanner, who, who probably would have gone through that and, and, you know, are back now again this year. Just what was it like kind of working through that with those guys during that time and, and in the offseason? Yeah. Off season and, and just what was that process kind of, kind of like? The draft can be challenging. Um no matter when it is or what's going on, you know, uh, at the end of the day, these guys are putting work in and they're trying to be better and they're trying to help us win ball games. Um, and in the middle of that, they're also trying to better themselves and, and start a professional career. So going through it back in the day as a young kid, um, it can be very stressful, whether you think you may go really high or you think you're gonna get taken decent or maybe I don't get taken at all. There's all sorts of ways to look at this thing. Um, but going through it, my piece is you have to acknowledge it, and we have to acknowledge that it's there and it's a real thing. You know, um, if you say don't worry about it, that's not realistic because there's no way to not think about it. That thing is um, it's pretty loud in regards to um, articles, uh, all sorts of things that are that are talking about this player and and the possibility of him being taken in a certain part of the draft. So just they have to know they know that I'm there for them. Um, they know that. We're going to acknowledge it and we're going to talk about it. And I like to acknowledge it and talk about it early and give them freedom to come to me if they need me. But for the most part, when we acknowledge it early, um, we kind of have a plan in place of how we're going to attack each and every day and not so much focus on the draft. Um, if you focus on the draft, things can get sideways really quick. But if you focus on being the best you can be every day and helping your team win and enjoying your time in Mississippi State, usually the natural talent just takes over and you get taken well but it's not easy it's not easy at all and um, as a coach you have to be able to pick your spots to, to know when to get in there and talk to them about it um, and, and just educate them on the whole process if that makes any sense quick kind of aside I know your boys had, had Darth Vader in Omaha a couple of years ago <laughs> have they got anything planned now for, for this year yet or? not we're not there yet we're not there yet um, but they're excited to be back in the ballpark that's for sure um, it's a special piece of having them with me, knowing they're over my right shoulder every game, and um, all of it's pretty special as a dad here. So uh, with nothing yet. We'll, we'll see how this season goes and see what, what the run looks like late, and, and we'll figure out something then. Good, Robbie. <laughs> on, on the same topic of the draft, Jake, from a recruiting standpoint and you as a, as a big-time recruiter, there's been so many guys in the past that, that Mississippi State hasn't been able to get to school when you look at – you know, guys like Corey Dickerson and Billy Hamilton, Austin Riley, you've been able to, to put a little bit of a dent in that, especially this year. I know it's different circumstances, but how have you seen the progress in getting some of that talent to come to campus over the last couple of years? Guys that would normally, you know, go in the first 10 rounds deciding to come to school. Have you seen some progress in that regard? Yeah. Um... And I wouldn't say there's any kind of a special formula or any kind of a plan in place. I think you have to be real with each player and their and their families. You know, um, uh, the fact that we have all been doing this a long time. Some of us went through it at a certain point. We can um, talk about life experiences, and all you're trying to do is be real and be honest, and, and be there for the families when they're going through that piece. Um, but everybody has their own certain way in which they get here. JT Ginn was um, was obviously a, a very very special player. Um, he had his own route into, into why he showed, and he had his own reasons and his own wants. Uh, he really wanted to be here, you know, and, um, and it worked out well for him. Um, the, the young group we have on campus right now, their situation is a little bit different. It was a funky, unique year, to say the least. Um, we all know why a lot of those guys didn't get their names called, um, but they're here, you know. And so uh, no matter how they get here, you just try to be there for them and be honest and educate them in the process. And... Sometimes life experiences, depending on playing career after college or working as an advisor, things like that. Um, I think as long as the families trust you and know that you're really trying to give good, honest information, um, you paint the picture of, of, of the good and bad of both sides, you know. Um, and really, we don't even get into the bad too much. It's all about what Mississippi State can do for, for each player and their family for the most part. But you have a pretty good idea of of where each player and family sits come draft time, you kind of know what they're thinking. And um, fortunately, we're all at Mississippi State, and it's a pretty special place, so everybody wants to come here for a little while, you know? And, and the more and more guys that show up and come here, and the more and more um, development that takes place, and, 
and the more we're on TV in Omaha and things like that, it just makes the ne next kid and family want to come come even more. So I'm um, just trying to do things the right way and, and, and be real and, and help these guys get better. Back to David. Coach, looking at the scrimmage stats from over the weekend, uh, the ball seemed to be jumping out a little bit more than maybe would have been expected. Uh, do you see this team having the potential for power, uh, particularly in the middle of the order? Potential for power, yeah. Um, that question gets asked a lot, and this may sound crazy because I'm the hitting coach. Um, the power piece, it doesn't consume me too much. You know, I, I think at the end of the year, you'll look up and most people will probably say, oh, wow, that guy hit, hit a few more than I thought, you know, but um, I think we can do it. I also know that if you try to do it or if you talk about it all the time, it doesn't work. A lot of our home runs, um, it's just a reaction. We have a good plan at the plate. We're looking for a certain pitch, and, and we put a good, nice, simple swing on it, and that's when the ball jumps. Um, but, but my piece throughout this whole deal, the, the whole formula, the whole system is, is being a good offense, being a great offense, actually, being a great offense. And um, it's hits, it's doubles, it's run scored, it's stealing bases, it's um, our two-strike fight, just grinding out starting pitchers and getting in the bullpen. And the more and more you do that, and the more at-bats you get, the more runs you score, the more times you get in the pin, um, I feel like at the end of the year, uh, you end up looking back and being pretty satisfied with, with the offensive production. Um, some years you may have more home runs, but I try not to live there. I love them. I love the homers. I hope we hit a lot of them, but, but I'm not too worried about it. Also looking at it, uh, jumping right into it with a big challenge this, uh, the first weekend and a good team in Tulane coming in the next weekend. Uh, what's the balancing act between getting guys swings in real games to learn what they are before SEC season and just having to play your best to beat really good teams? Yeah, well, the good thing is we're, we're facing one of the better probably pitching staffs in the country here every day, our own guys, you know. And so um, you're seeing a real competition for the guy on the bump and the guy in the box. Um, but it's good stuff. It's, it's the stuff that we're going to see all year long. So in regards to, to finding enough of at bats, that, that can be tricky for each guy, right? You want to make sure everybody's getting the at bats that they need to be ready. But in, in regards to the quality of competition that they're facing every day in our inner squads, um, it's what we're going to see during the year. So uh, I feel good about that piece. Um, facing our best guys every day is only going to make us better. I don't care if we're having success or if, we're ha if there's failure it's going to make us better in the end. Um, and then uh, opening day in Arlington against the Longhorns, I mean, you can look at your schedule all sorts of different ways, but the old coach speak, you want to be the best, you got to beat the best. So I like being challenged right out, right out of the shoot. Um, I, I don't, you don't know how it's going to go, but you're going to go into every game and one game at a time and, um, and try to take care of business and, and, and play our ball game. But the lights haven't come on yet, and we haven't been on the field with this group yet, but I know we like our group. Um, it's a talented group, but there's a lot more to it than that. You have to play as a team. You have to play clean baseball and um, play the Mississippi State way. But I think if we focus on that, um, and that's kind of the message all year every year uh, from Coach Lim is we just focus on playing our game and, and going about it the way we go about it. We usually feel pretty good going into whoever it is we may be playing on that given day, you know? so. Um, Tulane, my alma mater comes in week two, so I'll be excited about that. Um, those guys are my friends, and they have a good team, so that'll be cool. Good to Ben. Jake, I think kind of, kind of, I guess for you personally, like those draft guys, obviously you're a guy that's, that spent some time at Tulane and here now for a couple of years, and I think a lot of people see as a future head coach. Just what has your time at Mississippi State done for you as a coach, and, and how has that you know, helped you and, and what you're doing, and, and how have you kind of progressed in these three years, do you feel like? Uh, probably changed my life, to be honest with you. It, it really has. Um, just in general, how special this place is and how fortunate we all are to be here. But uh, this is a pretty special coaching staff. And it's a very tight-knit group. There's no egos. And Coach Lim, besides being one of my best friends, he's my boss too, but uh, I'm still trying to learn every day. You know, I think somebody that's in the position that I'm in as an assistant um, you have an idea of how you want to go about your piece of the puzzle, the recruiting piece and um, a hitting coach and an infield coach and things like that. But if you ever want to be a head coach, there's a lot that goes into it um, outside of being on the field or being in the batting cage. You know, it's he's the CEO of the program besides being the head coach. And so um, there's a lot of stuff that he has to do every single day that nobody has any idea of or ever even thinks of. Um, but 
he's on the field, he's great, he's great with the kids, but the, the CEO piece, everything that goes into it outside of uh, player development, things like that, um, he's one of the best. And so I, I'm, I'm learning from one of the best every single day. Uh, in regards to being a head coach, it, it, it's not coach speak or anything like that. I, I really don't live in that world. Um, it's the best place in the country for college baseball here. Um, my family loves it here. All is great here, you know? And so uh, my, my head coach in college, Rick Jones, and I ended up coaching for him a long time ago at Tulane, he said, just kind of embrace yourself, bury yourself in, in making the school that you're at the best that it can be every day, you know? And so, and, and good things will happen. And so that's kind of where I'm at. I, I try not to live in tomorrow. I try to live here today and um, love, we love it here. And we don't have any plans of leaving anytime soon. So that's where I'm at. And kind of to that, I mean, just obviously you guys have kept this whole staff together for your, for your time here for the most part. And I guess just what's that been like and how much does that help you having the continuity on staff that you guys have had? It's huge. It's like a bunch of brothers, you know, and um, the, the no egos piece is it's about as, as important as it gets, I think. Um, all great baseball guys, but more importantly, really good people um, that really care for the kids. And, you know, when, when you have a, a group of players that are together for a long time or you have a coaching staff that stays together for a long time, that's how culture is created, you know, and, and to be able to maintain that culture and everybody's on the same page, we're all going in the same direction. Um, it's really important. And so when I'm talking about recruiting or when I'm talking to recruits about the whole piece here, um, that's a really big piece of it is, hey, it's, Mississippi State sells itself. We all know that. Um, and it's, we've been doing well here lately, but at the end of the day, to kids and families, it's we know this place is special, but you have to realize the people that you're going to be surrounded by. And the most important out of all of it is that you're surrounded by good people that are also good baseball guys that'll help you. You know, but I don't. I don't if if you don't have good people, it can be challenging. All right, thanks, coach. All right, guys, thank you. See you soon.